Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the ICICI Prudential Life Insurance Company Limited, H1 FY2023 Earnings Conference Call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode. There will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. N. S. Kanan, MD and CEO. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Tanvi. Uh, good evening to all of you, and welcome to the results call of ICICI Potential Life Insurance Company for the half year ended September 30 of uh, financial year 2023. I have several of my senior colleagues with me on the call. Uh, Satyan Jambarnathan, CFO, Deepak Kinger, who is responsible for audit, legal, risk and compliance departments, Manish Kumar, who manages our investments, Shavik Jash, appointed actuary, Diren Salyam, deputy CFO, and Deeraj Chuga from the investor relations team. Let me start by uh, talking about a few developments during the quarter before I move on to our performance. First, I'm pleased to inform you that the members of the company have approved the item of special business pertaining to the appointment of Mr. Benjamin Balma as the non-executive director of the company, nominated by Prudential Corporation Holding Limited with effect from July 27, 2022, in place of Mr. Wilford Blackburn by way of an ordinary resolution through postal ballot. Second, I would also like to share that ICRA, ICRA, a domestic credit rating agency, has uh, reaffirmed the long-term rating for our subordinated debt program as ICRA AAA. The outlook on the long-term rating is also stable. The third development on the regulatory front, in line with IRDA's vision that by the year 2047, which happens to be the centenary year of India's independence, every Indian should have life cover and every family should have health cover and old age security. On this uh, vision, the authority has taken several measures with a clear focus on increasing insurance penetration in the country and ease of doing business for companies like us. I would like to talk about some of these measures. IRDA formed the Regulatory Review Committee, RRC, comprising 22 members, to examine the regulatory framework comprehensively. The Regulation Review Committee has been entrusted with the task of streamlining and recommending simplified regulations, which are principles-based, with a view to enhance the ease of doing business and making the regulatory regime at par with the global standards. Further, the regulators proposed the formation of Bhima Sugam, an all-in-one digital platform for solicitation, servicing, and claims. We believe that this would be a game changer and possibly the UPA moment for the insurance industry. Over time, we expect this unified platform to be used by the large number of customers to fulfill all their insurance needs, as also by insurers as well as intermediaries, in conjunction with other market participants, such as insurance repositories, and also connectivity to external databases and ecosystems. We welcome the relaxations provided by the regulator with respect to allowing certain categories of products to be launched through the use and file approach, relaxation of investment norms, and ease of documentation for purchase of immediate energy products. Further, a series of exposure drafts have been released by the regulator in the areas of distribution, expenses of management, other forms of capital, dematerialization of insurance policies. We believe that these regulatory reforms will structurally and functionally reform the sector and boost insurance growth and development while enhancing ease of doing business for the insurance industry. The fourth development during this period uh, is about uh, ESG. As briefed earlier, we had adopted the ESG framework in, uh, in the year 2020. To sharpen our existing board oversight on ESG, the board has enhanced the terms of reference of the CSR committee of the board to also include oversight of our sustainability agenda. The committee has accordingly been renamed as the board sustainability and CSR committee. As a result, we now have a formal structure with the board overseeing the ESG matters, the board sustainability and CSR committee focusing on monitoring ESG initiatives and disclosures, and the executive sustainability steering committee driving the ESG agenda within the organization. I would like to here reaffirm re re my commitment, our commitment 
to create a culture that embraces sustainability. I am also happy to state that we continue to be the best ranked Indian insurer based on reports by major ESG rating agencies. I will now move on to the performance of the company for the quarter. Our four key strategic elements, that is premium growth, protection business growth, persistence improvement, and productivity enhancement continue to guide us towards our objective of growing the absolute value of new business, while ensuring all the time that our customer is at the core of everything we do. I'll summarize our performance on the four phase through slides five to nine of our presentation, which is uh, loaded, uh, and then conclude with a commentary on the MB. Satyan will then be taking you through the performance uh, in detail. So let me start with the first P of our strategic elements, which is premium growth. Our annualized premium equivalent APE grew sequentially by 32% for the second quarter of this fiscal. We ended the first half of the year at an APE of 35.19 billion rupees with a 10% year-on-year growth and the new business premium of 73.59 billion rupees with a 14% year-on-year growth. As you, can, as you can see in slide number six of the presentation, for H1 of FI 2023, a contribution to APE from linked products stood at 41%, non-linked savings at 28%, protection at 20%, annuity at 7%, and the balance 4% came from group savings. We would like to highlight that this quarter onwards, we have started disclosing the distribution mix based on retail APE. The retail distribution mix of the first half of the fiscal APE is 40% from bank assurance channel, 31% from agency channel, 15% from direct business, and balance from other partnerships at 14%. Here, our focus is on investment in building existing channels and also widening the distribution to maintain the diversified distribution mix. Further, we believe that the recent exposure draft wherein a corporate agent can tie up with up to nine insurers instead of three now, if implemented, we believe that it will provide us a great opportunity to expand our distribution network further. We believe that our diversification agenda on both the product and the distribution mix is on track, thereby enabling us to manage the impact of external development and respond to the changing consumer preferences and behavior in an agile manner. <clears throat> Moving on to the second P of protection business, uh, which is presented on slide seven, the total protection AP is at 7.1 billion rupees in the first half of this current fiscal, <clears throat> resulting in an increase in the protection mix from 17% for the whole of last fiscal to 20% for the first half of this fiscal. Protection AP has continued to grow in both the quarters of fiscal year 2023. The growth was 22%, if you'll remember, uh, in the first quarter on a year-on-year -year basis, which has accelerated to 35% year-on-year growth in the second quarter, resulting in a 29% year-on-year year -on -year growth in the first half. I would like to highlight that based on the total new business sum assured, our market share has increased from 13.4% for financial year 2022 to 15.7% in H1 FI 2023. With this, we continue to hold on to our market leadership in, in terms of some assured, new business some assured in the private sector. We continue to take a risk calibrated approach to underwriting and our practices are commensurate with the prices offered, including emphasizing sourcing of preferred customer profiles. Further, we have been leveraging the opportunity in the group protection business, even as we seek to revive the retail protection business. On the third P of persistency presented in slide eight, we continue to see significant improvement across cohorts. Our 13-month persistency ratio has increased by 130 basis points from 84.6% at March 2022 to 85.9% at September 2022. Similarly, our 49-month month persistency ratio has increased by 200 basis points from 63.4 at March 2022 to 65.4 as of September 2022. Moving on to the fourth P of productivity, which is presented in slide nine, our total expenses grew by 20.9% year on year for the first half of the current fiscal. The absolute expenses are of course higher as compared to the same period last year, 
because we have been investing in building for future growth alongside our four p strategy framework we continue to maintain a resilient balance sheet as we have presented in slide number 10 of our presentation we have evaluated the insurance risk and the emerging mortality experience and this is within our expectation and we will continue to monitor it closely as we go forward as well we received the covid-19 claims net of reinsurance of 272 million rupees for the first half of current fiscal out of which 26 million rupees were pertaining to covid-19 debts in the first half of the current fiscal thus we have released the covid-19 provisions which we were carrying carrying till the last quarter our solvency ratio continues to be strong at 200.7% as of september 2022 as compared to the regulatory threshold of 150% our asset center management aum to that to this 2.443 trillion at september 2022 on credit risk only 0.3% of our fixed income portfolio is invested in instruments rated below double a and we continue to maintain a track record of not having a single npa since inception of our total liabilities non par guaranteed return products comprise about 2.8% while 77.2% liabilities are primarily linked to market performance we continue to closely monitor our liquidity and alm positions and we have no issues to report moving on to value of new business vnb as a result of the above drivers the vnb for h1 fi 2023 was 10.92 billion rupees a growth of 25.1% over the corresponding period last year given our ap of rupees 35.19 billion the resultant vnb margin was 31% for h1 financial year 2023 as compared to 28% for the whole of uh, last fiscal and 27.3 in the first half of the last financial year while this increase in vnb margin is primarily on account of shift in underlying product mix we on our side continue to focus on growth in absolute vnb before i hand over to satyan uh, to talk us through some of the details i would like to maintain that we continue to maintain our objective of uh, doubling financial year 19 vnb by the end of this financial year which requires a vnb growth rate of around 33% for the whole of this financial year over the last financial year vnb with a vnb growth of 25.1% for the first half and with a favorable premium base for the coming months from here on we believe that we are on track to achieve this aspiration our primary objective is to outperform the industry on vnb growth over the medium term towards this we believe all necessary levers are available with us with this i thank you all for joining the call and i am handing over the call to satyan to take us through the performance of the company in detail thank you kanan good evening our primary focus continues to be to grow the absolute value of new business through the 4p strategy of premium growth protection business growth consistency improvement and productivity improvement on the first element of premium growth we continue to leverage on our innovative and comprehensive suite of products distribution strength robust technology and strong risk management architecture We have recently launched ICICI Pro Suk Samriddhi, a participating savings product, to enhance our offering in the category. Coming to product performance on slide 15, you will note that we have registered a strong growth in the non-link savings, protection, and annuity segments, which have contributed to our APE growth of 10% year on year for H1 FI 2023. with an APE of 2.33 billion and a 69% year on year growth in H1 FI 23 we were one of the largest pension and annuity providers in the market the protection and annuity business now contributes approximately 50% of the total new business received premium our focus has been to sustain growth in the annuity line of business by driving synergy between our company and a subsidiary icsa prudential pension fund management company the aum managed by the pfm 
has increased by 36% over September 2021 to 132.44 billion at September 2022. The PFM has a market share of 14.8% in the private sector AUM at September 30th, 2022. <clears throat> Moving on to distribution, on slide 17, a well-diversified distribution Selling comprehensive products suited to customer needs has been our goal. Strengthening the existing network and widening distribution with new partnerships has been one of our key focus areas. During the half year, we have added over 15,000 new agents, three new banks, and 44 non-bank partnerships. As we stand today, we also leverage more than 13,000 bank branch network of our partners for the distribution of our insurance products. Coming to the performance of these distribution channels on slide 18, you will note that we have witnessed growth across most channels. The second element of protection growth on slide 20, with an APE of rupees 7.10 billion, the protection segment saw a growth of 29.1% over H1-FI 2022. In this segment, we continue to take advantage of the opportunity available in the group business, specifically on group credit life products. We continue to witness significant demand for the group protection products, especially now with the pricing recalibrated closer to the pre-COVID-19 levels. The retail protection growth though challenged on a year-on-year -year basis, has broadly stabilized on a sequential basis. We have also been encouraging rider attachment on our savings products and term products. The term product with return of premium that we had launched last year continues to contribute about 15 to 20% of the retail protection portfolio. This is a category creation exercise which we believe will take time to develop. With all these initiatives, our total new business sum assured stood at 4.8 trillion for H1-FY 2023, a growth of 42.3% year on year. We have retained market leadership in the private market space with a sum assured market share of 15.7% in HY 2023. The third element of persistency on slide 22, we continue to have a strong focus on improving the quality of business and customer retention, which is reflected across all cohorts. There has been a significant improvement across all cohorts in the last one year, with our 13th month and 49th month persistency ratios improving to 85.9% and 65.4% respectively at September 2022. <clears throat> The fourth element of productivity on slide 24, our overall cost to total weighted received premium ratio stood at 21.6% and the cost to TWRP ratio for the savings business at 14.4% and the cost to average AUM at 2.2% for H1-FI 2023. During the COVID affected year, we had curtailed some of our discretionary expenses. This year, we have started to see a normalization of such spends. In addition, we are also investing in building blocks to enable future sustainable growth. In any case, under the Indian Embedded Value Principles, VNB is computed after considering all expenses during the year. For increased productivity, we continue to invest in technology, which is central to our strategy, thereby aiding us to provide better value to our customers. Specifically on slide 40, we have detailed some of the key initiatives undertaken in H1 FY 2023. We are happy to report that we are now a financial information user and a financial information provider in the account aggregator ecosystem. We believe this will ease the entire documentation and verification process for customers going forward. The usage of data excellence at every phase of our customer journey has also been detailed on slide 41. The outcome of our focus on these four P's, as you may see on slide 25, has resulted in the VNB of rupees 10.92 billion 
for H1 FI2023, a growth of 25.1% over H1 FI2022. Given our APE of 35.19 billion, the resultant VNB margin was 31% for H1 FI23 as compared to 27.3% in H1 FI2022 and 28% in FI22. While this increase in VNB is primarily on account of shift in underlying product mix, we continue to focus on absolute VNB growth, which is our stated objective. As the product mix evolves over the rest of the year, the VNB margin is expected to move in line with the underlying product mix. Coming to the financial metrics, our profit after tax for H1 FY23 was 3.55 billion compared to 2.59 billion in H1 FY2022, primarily on account of significantly lower COVID-19 claims. Our value of enforced business or WIF grew by 16.4% year on year and stood at 247.97 billion at September 2022. The adjusted net worth reflects the mark to market impact on the investment portfolio. The embedded value grew by 8.1% and stood at 326.48 billion at September 2022. To summarize, we continue to monitor ourselves on the 4P framework of premium growth, protection business growth, persistency improvement, and productivity improvement. Our performance on these dimensions is what we expect to feed into our objective of doubling the FY19 BNB in the financial year, in this financial year, and BNB growth over time. Thank you. We are now happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, you may enter star and one to ask a question. We will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. First question is from the line of Swarnab Mukherjee from BNK Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, Swarnab. Hi, hi, sir. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. So, a uh, couple of questions. First one on the uh, ROP product. So, I was uh, looking at the run rate uh, since the last three quarters that the product has been, uh, you know, been launched. The run rate remains fairly same across quarter in the absolute number. Uh, I understand that 4Q was, of course, a very small period in which the product was uh, was launched. Uh, now, I wanted to understand you, as you mentioned, it's a category creation exercise and it will take time. But if you could throw some color on uh, what are the efforts that are being put in and what is, if there are any kind of challenges that you are seeing, maybe it from the channel side or maybe from, you know, what the customer is asking for in the product and whether if there is any supply side issue also in this, like we have seen in the retail protection side. So this, that would be my first question, sir. Sure, Swarnam. Uh, so you're right. It has been consistent at 15 to 20% over the past three quarters since we have launched it. Uh, and as you mentioned, it is a category creation. The point really is that the customer segment which is choosing this product is a more mass-oriented customer segment. And therefore, for this to continue growing, it will have to be based on a suitable distribution customer segment match. Typically, distribution channels which have a strength in more mass-oriented customers, such as agencies or small finance bank and some other distribution partners who have access to that customer segment, are what will popularize this. We don't see any supply side issues in this. These products are priced with an appropriate level of mortality, and therefore I don't expect that to be a challenge. I think it is contributing meaningfully even now in that we are not out of line with the rest of the market with the exception of one company. I do think that it will take a period of time before it becomes a larger mix, but we are quite happy with the way that this business is progressing. And just to add to that, uh, I would only say that uh, we would be 
more focused on growing the retail protection pie together and we are quite happy if uh, rupi continues to stay at 15 to 20 percent that we are quite okay with that outcome the focus is more on growing the entire pie rather than focusing on rupi or non rupi okay sir that's helpful uh, any comment on the pure term side what are you seeing and uh, should we expect uh, any uh, growth uh, uh, i mean any movement this year so yeah, pure on the, re- yeah. on the retail protection uh, <clears throat> so year on year basis uh, obviously you would have seen that uh, this uh, challenge because that's also looking overall numbers are also uh, still declining on retail protection of course we give out the numbers only by the end of the year in terms of split between retail and group but i can say that uh, uh, year on year declines have been coming down on retail protection that's one trend i can point out towards and the second trend is that uh, on a sequential basis when i look at uh, it has been uh, stable uh, so that is the two trends i can tell you demand side uh, we are not seeing any lack of demand demand continues to be good stable for this uh, product and uh, if i really look at the underwriting side the processes are stabilized and the pricing is also stabilized so those are the indications i can give you in terms of a sequential stabilization stabilization of processes and stabilization of pricing and that is what we are seeing with a lot of uh, uh, you know lot of positive outlook in this segment as we move forward now um, if we look at the customer protection from a demand perspective uh, why i say that the demand is intact is because we are seeing a rider attachment increase if i look at the ulips uh, the rider attachment has gone up to about uh, 45% plus uh, in the uh, uh, in the recent month if you look at the rider attachment in term that has also gone up so these are the things which give me an indication that uh, the, the protection demand is quite intact uh, amongst the uh, consumers now to answer your question on when it will really look up i think uh, the growth will come back in the second half of the year that is what we believe Uh, because uh, this, when you look at the last year the second half uh, things have started plateauing and actually started coming down and slowly we are clawing our way, way back in terms of a sequential uh, stabilization now and the slowly a sequential improvement which in the second half we are hoping that will uh, result in the year on year growth also this is the color i can give you on your term on the retail side on the other side your term on the group side that is growing quite well um just uh, there have been some news reports about the pricing and all that but uh, we believe that uh, the the employer employee and other groups do have a lot of need for the group term cover so the continuous movement towards increasing the employee coverage or the coverage per employee uh, and we are one of the leaders when it comes to this segment so that is also helping us to continue to show a robust growth on the group segment as well so this this is the color i can give you so the sense is that by the time when you see any plateau on the group side the retail would have got stabilized and then they will come to, to help us on the growth of overall protection sure sir so that's very helpful uh, a couple of quick questions on the channel side uh, first on the non icici banks so that's uh, that segment has been growing very strongly Uh, if you could give some um, details on you know what would be the product mix difference between uh, say non icic bank and icic bank for us to gauge you know how this growth can pan out going ahead uh, yeah if you really look at icic bank first as we have always uh, told you uh, from a customer franchise perspective they have not been selling uh, any uh, non linked products in the saving side so that uh, strategy is sort of continues so the focus of the channel on icic bank just to give you a color continues to be on protection and of course given that uh, in general you are seeing the supply uh, side constraints on protection uh, i as 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 uh, same as icic bank and rest of the channels as well same as uh, us in the industry as well given that um, it has been a bit slow but given that uh, the environment is improving and as i said earlier mm-hmm. things are being stabilizing on the retail protection we should expect the growth uh, to happen in icic bank protection on annuity icic bank continues to drive growth on uh, linked of course uh, since they don't uh, distribute non linked on linked given the environment and the market conditions um, it is uh, that, that has been a decline in icic bank because they don't sell any traditional products to offset the decline in the uh, unit so this is as far as icic bank is concerned 
but we are happy to <coughs> look at uh, protection and annuity as two key segments for growth in icsr bank now you talked about the other uh, uh, you know uh, thing first let me talk about other banks so wherever we have tied up with the banks in the last couple of years we continue to see momentum in those banks and those banks are very much focused on the fee income uh, rising out of uh, insurance and that is something we are leveraging as well so that uh, part is moving and you have seen in our retail distribution uh, other banks other than icic contributing to about uh, 17% of our uh, numbers 17% of our business so this was uh, that itself is testimony to uh, how things have been moving on the non uh, non banks and uh, we have added uh, three more bank partners of course these are all cooperative and small uh, small banks that's what we have added and that is something which uh, we are uh, having um then as i as i said in my opening remarks the exposure draft the irds says that corporate agent can buy up with nine life insurance insurers instead of uh, three i see it as a great opportunity because we are used to not just working with icic bank but also working with uh, uh, 30 banks now so that itself should give us a good entry into this new opportunity and that is something we will be in a you know focused manner we will be going now you asked about the uh, products uh, in the <coughs> other than icic bank segment we are really left to the partners you know if you really ask me some of the smaller banks really ask us to do only traditional products and not so much on unit link products and that is something we are happy to do with them if you look at the agency side the agency also used to be skewed for years back towards unit but uh, agency now is becoming something like a one third one third one third in terms of traditional protection annuity and the other uh, products so because and we believe that it is the right match because the kind of, kind of uh, the customer segments they cater to they would be a lot of mass and mass flow and kind of segments where this kind of a product mix is probably a better mix compared to the highly skewed unit product mix so to answer your question yes uh, you know the channel by channel uh, we do have the um, you know mix uh, which uh, which we have left it to the uh, respective bank partners uh, or the other partners and we will take the outcome as it comes that has been our our approach for example if you look at our slide 17 Uh, we have uh, talked about what has been our strategy in each of the segments if you look at the agency as an example their protection and annuity is 31% non link selling is 35% and link is 34% so if you look at the bank assurance protection annuity mix is 42% so this is uh, and then partnership distribution which is corporate agents and brokers we have product and the protection and annuity mix of 28% and non link selling is 61% so these are all the outcomes based on the customer segments the channels are catering to and the channel preferences so that is the way we would like to uh, and we have come to a situation today as a company that we are a 40% ulf and uh, 20% uh, protection and uh, you know the the balance uh, constituting traditional and other products that we are completely completely neutral uh, and we are very happy to cater to the customer and the channel requirements in terms of product mix Sure, sir. And in, in terms of the sorry to interrupt, sir. So I would request yeah. you to please come I'll back come and interview. Yeah. Sure. Thank, Thank you, you very much, ladies and gentlemen. In order to ensure that the management is able to address the questions from all participants, we request you to limit your questions to two per participant. Should you have any further questions, you may join the queue back. The next question is from the line of Avinash Singh from MK Global. Please go ahead. Hi, Avinash. Yeah. Hi, Karan. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, one, just again, uh, uh, going to uh, you know the accounting topic of circular generation. I would just need your help. I can see. I mean, if I am looking Y O Y for the quarter, uh, the big variance has come in three parts. Shareholder accounts understood how the markets were so realized gains. I understand. Non-par life again because you have seen a strong growth. So of course there will be a strain or like uh, you know uh, it will have a negative surplus. another big swing that is in the non par annuity surplus now i mean the last two quarters negative i understand what was if you can help me why it was such a big positive number last year the same quarter so i mean why there is such a swing when it comes to surplus in the your annuity uh why why this is because that is the thing that is driving kind of a why why surplus uh, lowers so if you can help me that's for question avinash the strain under the annuity portfolio it's a function of mix between single pay and regular pay and also a function of the tenor of the deferral period for annuity so for every period the annuity strain need not be the same 
we recently launched a regular paid deferred annuity which is much more longer term so the strain profile for the annuity business this year is definitely different from what it was in the past year okay and last year it was a big positive number it had generated surplus while some impact and based on the mortality or something i mean just i try to understand so the last year no, like 100 no mortality it uh, last year in the same period there may also have been some realized investment income on the fixed income portfolio that may have caused it but otherwise there is nothing unusual that is happening on those portfolios it's really a function of the underlying mix of what we are selling okay Uh, the second question now of course in annual report or uh, uh, you know the details of your hedging is this too just i mean on incremental basis in the first half from march 22 to now what would have been you know the mtm movement in your uh, fra and what that uh, its impact on your solvency and network if you can help me first half mtm on fra has had no impact on solvency because in aggregate the equity portfolio plus the fra portfolio mtm is net positive so there is no impact on solvency you can't take credit for positive only if it is in aggregate negative will you take a hit from a solvency point of view so there is no impact in fact the mtm has come down quite sharply at the end of this quarter than it was at the end of the last quarter those numbers are not specifically publicly disclosed but i can confirm no adverse or positive impact on solvency and mtm impact substantially lower now than it has been at the end of the last two quarter okay okay so i mean uh, your equity mtm and uh, fra hedging mtm both put together i mean if they are negative then only you have a hit on solvency i mean uh, of course you cannot take positive but, uh, yes, but a kind of a, if you are getting uh, so if you are doing some negative on uh, fra and some positive uh, equity i mean they kind of cancel each other okay that is correct Okay. Okay. Lastly, I mean, again, this is very really minor thing. Uh, there is some kind of a negative, uh, you know, uh, in your uh, revaluation in the in the property side. Is it because of some sale or like uh, some property uh, valuation has uh, certain investment property has come down? So, you, so you are talking about negative one? No, no. Uh, some decline. If I look at sequentially, your revaluation reserve in property has come down slightly. Of course, a very minor number, but typically, I think. Uh, so, is it some kind of sale of property, or is it like a usual revaluation? Okay. No, no, it's just a usual revaluation. We get it done once a year. You won't have any change in this period. You would have had it at the end of last year. This period, the only thing that would have happened on property would be that we moved one piece of our property from the par pension fund to par life fund. So, to that extent, it may be sitting in a different place. But there is no revaluation which has happened this quarter. That typically happens only at 31st March. Thank you. Thank you. I will come back to you. Thanks, sir. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shreya Shivani from CLSA. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, congratulations for a good set of numbers, sir. I had a question on the um, uh, new banking, uh, new bank partner that you've added. Shreya Shivani, there is some disturbance coming from your finish. Um, okay, one second. Uh, is it better now? you seem to be in a windy place nice meeting please go ahead hi it's, hi so i just wanted uh, clarification on the three new bank partners you've added uh, just a, a bit of a understanding on how many bank partners do you look to add uh, these new bank partners i just heard they are usually they are they are small banks i believe uh, are you like the number one two third insurer for them so some more flavor around these new bank partners is, uh, is my first question and uh, my second question is any ape guidance that you have for the full year of this year so share these three partners actually got added in the first quarter so they are in the first half year in this quarter we haven't added anybody new uh, these are very small so it doesn't really matter whether we have how much share of shop we have uh, but the point really is that all of these partners put together now are building into a reasonable scale and i think that's the more important part that we tend to focus on with now 17% of the retail ape coming from the non primary bank partnership that we have developed uh, so to that extent these are not big let's see going forward whether we are able to get more or not 
without an objective we would like as many as who as people would like to have us but it's really a long gestation period we keep working and pitching with various uh, potential bank partners to establish a credentials and if it comes to it should be positive ap guidance for the year we have not given any ap guidance we are still uh, holding on to our expectation of the 23% vnb growth we have said this in the past uh once upon a time we would have to depend on a 20% ape growth to get to that vnb growth but now the degrees of freedom are many more given the diversification and products so even if the ape growth is either faster than what it was for h1 or even a little slower than what it was for h1 we still feel that we have a fair shot at getting to the objective got it understood thank you sir thanks sir thank The next question is from the line of Sanket Koda from Spark Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Hi, Sanket. Uh, 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 hi, Kamal. Uh, sorry, hi, Sachin. Sorry. Uh, uh, Sachin, uh, just uh, just wanted to take that ICICI non-ICICI bank growth, uh, which was very strong around six to nine percent in the first quarter. Something I assume it should be because of a low base uh, uh, in, in the previous quarter. But but it seems to have moderated a bit to fourteen percent in. Uh, in, in 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 second quarter, uh, uh, though the one-inch numbers looks very strong, but but second quarter looks to be little uh, uh, moderating, and and the divergence of the it is converging closer to the overall EP growth of the company. Uh, and, and 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 if I look at similarly to the other channels like agency and direct, they also have not done that well relatively, uh, given given the partnership channels have done well. So so just just wanted to understand. Uh, uh, Any anything to read why non ICICI bank channels have have not grown to the expectation or or again the same point that the market share uh, potential which we had a low hanging fruit we have reached it and, and incrementally it is more a channel growth. So Sanket, the way I would look at it is this: I'll maybe talk about the agency and direct first before I get there. Agency had a very very strong base in Q2 of last year, and some of that is what we are seeing come through as a base effect. also in agency you would have noticed that one third of the business is unit linked to the extent that unit linked has been a bit more of a struggle in the current quarter that is an impact which has happened as we get to the next two quarters typically both december and march tend to be fairly peak periods for agency so we have no concerns about the trajectory for growth for agency into the next two quarters direct to customer for us is predominantly the upsell channel executed by our proprietary sales force now this is executed on existing customers given that our existing customers are predominantly unit link oriented this channel has seen the same impact that we have seen for the unit link category as a whole and that's why for the quarter it was relatively slow as we go into the next two quarters we think that should not uh, that should again self correct over a period of time so again from a direct point of view while the number does seem modest we are not concerned in any material fashion about the trajectory banks other than icici bank i mean from a 70 80% growth in the past i would hesitate to say that it will not moderate that it will moderate mm. those are periods of time that will happen i don't think one should read too much into what happens in a month or what happens in a quarter this is a channel which has been growing at a fairly robust pace and if you look at even the wider industry context this is a segment which has been doing as well as the rest of the industry as well so from a growth point of view i would actually say that the base effect is going to be an important determinant through these quarters the like kanan mentioned in his opening comments q2 last year was a yoy 35% growth and eventually q3 and q4 last year were 16 and 4% growth that should be a slightly more benign base when we look at potential growth into the future so yes you will always have periods of improving growth or decreasing growth but i'm not so sure that we can live our life based on what happens on a month on month basis got it uh, got it kanan Uh, sorry, 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 that's useful. And, and uh, second thing, uh, second was was uh, was just just to understand that uh, if I look at our look at our 61st month consistency uh, compared to FI 22, it has improved very sharply. Uh, from 54, it is almost 61. Uh, so so which means uh, to to some extent, can we assume that we have a lever 
uh, given given this is a structural improvement in the uh, improvement improvement in the persistency after five years uh, in the mass lactation assumption after five years of completion. Uh, 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 is is that a lever substantially available from a career point of view to to, to, to further expand the margin? Yes, Sanket. It may well be a lever when we get to the end of the year, but we would like to assess it when we get there. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, and finally, uh, uh, if you can quantify the MTM impact or negative econo economic variance number on the embedded value in the one H number, uh, 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 given given uh, uh, the impact on the network seems to be around 509 crores, uh, uh, just, just uh, uh, on embedded value, how, uh, 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 how much it could be? So Sanket, we have not disclosed that specifically. We will have to wait for the full year before we disclose all the breakup of movement in embedded value. Got it. Perfect. Uh, uh, okay. yeah, I, can only, I can only reiterate that the value of Infor has continued to see a very strong growth at 16 and a half percent year on year. Yeah, got it. Got it. Thanks. Thanks. That's it for me. Thanks, Sanket. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ansuman Deep from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. So, uh, so one of my question was regarding that uh, persistency part. So we have seen a very sharp increase. And uh, it could be because of a little bit of lower ULIPS. But uh, regarding our base case assumptions, is there a chance for a positive uh, release in the year end, right? Uh, that would be my first question. So, Anshuman, hi. Uh, that's what I confirmed in response to Sanket's question as well. It may well be the case. We'll see where it gets to. Right now, I'm not getting into an explanation of what is causing this. Whatever is the cost of improvement, I will take it happily. Right, sir. Absolutely, absolutely. Point well taken. And the second question is more of a uh, thought process in the sense when we uh, started this journey of doubling the VNB, uh, you know, we had a very high protection growth. Uh, uh, trajectory and as we move moved ahead and we are almost uh, as you as you rightly said we have a, a great shot of uh, kind of meeting that objective it has been more towards savings so if you could uh, just tell us in terms of the strategy of the company has it absolutely remained same in terms of like you know as per uh, the whatever the customer demand is or we have uh, done certain special uh, strength or objectives in meeting a protection, a, a savings kind of a, a business. Because we have now a significant uh, portfolio in terms of savings, which has given us a good BNB growth. So Anshuman, what we had articulated then was that protection and annuity would be very significant engines for us to grow our BNB. That has not changed at all. And I don't think protection growth has slowed down. If you just look at this year, First quarter protection growth was 22%. Second quarter protection growth was 35%. So I know we all get very caught up about retail protection. And in that, we miss the fact that the protection business growth is actually not moderated. I, I, would, I, I think most, most companies across the world would give an arm and a leg to get a 30% growth in, in protection over a half-year period. So to that extent, I'm absolutely no discomfort with the way the product is uh, moving. What we have added to our armory that we did not have five years back is what you mentioned, a wider product suite. Now, the, the, the benefit of the wider product suite is that it helps us reach many more customers and improve opportunity. So the purpose of widening the product suite was not about improving margins. It was about the, it was about adding more to growth. It was about getting more customer opportunity that were not choosing the product categories that we were present in earlier. So strategically, nothing has changed. Protection and annuity are very very core elements in our VNB growth. Savings, whatever is the need of the customer, we are happy to offer. But whatever we offer on savings. Risk will be a very big filter. Market risk is not something, or unhedged market risk is not something that we would want to take on a balance sheet. Great, sir. Yeah, uh, that's very clear, sir. Thank you. That will be all. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Dipanjan Ghosh from City. Please go ahead. Hi, Dipanjan. Uh, hi, sir. 
uh, photo module. So that uh, maybe you know, following up on one of the points which has been discussed in the call, uh, you know, on your non-ICICI bank uh, channel, uh, bank issuance channel, uh, could you give some color on the counter share that you maintain out there, or in other words, are you going faster than the channel in terms of larger non-ICICI bank partners? And my second question, you know, on similar lines, you mentioned that uh, the proposed circular by idea is to expand open architecture and bank issuance channels is favorable for the company because you get to tie up or you have a chance to tie up with some of the other uh, banker partners. But if you go back uh, and see the history of the events that happened after the first open architecture, uh, there is also a chance that some of the smaller players get to enter the channels or the core channels, X, I, C, I, C, Bank, where you have been going at a faster pace today. So how do you kind of uh, you know think of it from that perspective also, maybe four, five years down the line? Even the founder smaller players also have a relatively diversified product to take today compared to let's say what they were having three, four years back. So uh, those were the two questions. On the other bank partnerships, at least what we are seeing is we are more than proportionately contributing to the growth of their business. The objective that we are focusing on is to expand the pie for them. Uh, and that eventually is resulting and will continue to result in an increasing share of shop. But our objective is about growing the pie for them. So to that extent, we are very comfortable with the progress and we will continue to work on it. With respect to an open architecture ecosystem, I think eventually every bank will have to make their decision on what they are comfortable with. Whether they want to stay with one, stay with three, expand to five, go all the way to nine or whatever else that the regulation may permit. We expect the regulation to be permissive, but not mandating. And therefore, to that extent, even if it means in some of the partnerships where we are one of three, if somebody else enters, we would like to think that our brand is still significant enough, our product width is still good enough, and our technology capability is still strong enough for us to maintain our position. And to the extent that some of the banks which may have lesser partners are not opened up, if it gives us an opportunity, we would be happy to take it. But like I said, it does not in any way uh, establish that currently partners who are only distributing for one insurance company, such as an SBI Life or a Code SBI or a Kotak or an ICICI bank, will move from one to multi. That is a decision they have to take over a period of time. We don't think there is anything given about what that outcome will be. On balance, we see the opening up to be more positive to us than adverse. Uh, thanks for the detailed explanation. Just, just one small question. Uh, we have seen some of the banks increase their uh, term deposit rates over the past, uh, let's say, one month to two months in a very aggressive manner. And uh, assuming credit quotes continues to remain at levels they are, probably we can expect to see some amount of uh, faster translation of the repo height rate um, to the overall term deposit rate. On that piece, do you see some of the guaranteed return products uh, across the industry? Uh, seen some amount of pressure on incremental uh, growth out there in two years or maybe uh, the next calendar year? So, Dipanjan, at one level, I know we all tend to compare bank deposits with guaranteed return products, but all said and done, the products are chalk and cheese. Bank deposits, 75-80% of bank deposits are for a tenor of up to three years. All insurance products are five years plus. We have life cover, which makes it very different. And overall, when I look at the banking system flows, we are but a small part of it. And if indeed it was so fungible, in the last two years, insurance companies should have been going at 50% per annum. I don't think that's quite what has happened. So yes, at, at a conceptual level, it seems substitutive. I don't think in actual buying behavior, it is as closely reflected. From our point of view, what's important is that as long as we reflect available yields, and as long as people see value in the product, whether adjusted for tax or otherwise, that will keep the demand for the product alive. In case we start seeing the change or a shift in the cycle from high interest rates to lower interest rates, we may well see a shift in product mix from non-par to par. And that's something that we would be very comfortable with. I don't think that would be a problem at all from our point of view. So we wouldn't get too caught up. I don't think an opportunity is created by a product an opportunity is actually created by a customer opportunity. A product is only a way to leverage that opportunity. So beyond a point, we wouldn't worry too much about these relativity. Sure. Uh, 
thank you that was on my side and uh, all the best thank you thank you the next question is from the line of neeraj toshniwal from ubs india please go ahead hello yes, hello sir. please yeah. go ahead yeah hi sir uh, so my first question is i wanted to clarify on the group protection pricing recalibration so has it been totally accounted for or we may see some impact coming the uh, subsequent quarters so that growth might actually you know take an impact from the same hi neeraj uh, group protection at renewal now we are seeing a pricing which is pre pandemic level so every scheme that gets renewed i would expect at least over the next 3 months or so assuming that nothing else happens on the pandemic side will be at a lower pricing pre pandemic this has already been the case for the past 3 months or so right so what you are seeing as growth for the quarter is despite or after the change in price that has happened on group term so so we have added the new partners or uh, we have we were able to add uh, yeah. at the middle mid level corporates as well because only the focus only larger corporates i understand in yeah, terms yeah. of pandemic absolutely you are right that is what we had said we want to target and we are doing that and that is working well for us so far got it and the uh, second question i have is uh, in terms of understanding just to mention that we might see shift of product from non par guarantee products towards par and we have recently launched um, product towards par as well are uh, probably thinking on the same lines so uh, wanted to understand the margin trajectory or the absolute bnb as well in the over the next course of let's say uh, i understand you have already given guidance to fy 23 but beyond that would it become a linear or even uh, because par and the sun would be a much lower margin compared to non par how should one think about it uh, in terms of aggregate margin profiling so near the way we tend to look at it is there is an overall savings portfolio margin which will be driven by a combination of linked mix par mix non par mix at any point of time amongst these you will see some shift in mix i don't think we can stand up and say that the mix is going to be stable at exactly some level over a period of time the point that we are making very simply is that we are happy to take whatever is the margin outcome our approach is more on absolute vnb and in a way the more pronounced impact on margin will not be about par non par it will be about protection annuities versus other parts of saving so there will always be pluses and minuses we are not at this stage seeing anything to suggest uh, downside risk to margin we think there should be stability if at all we would expect there to be a positive bias over a period of time given the fact that protection retail protection may come back once retail protection comes back within protection itself the portfolio margin can improve second the mix itself of protection can improve third persistency delivery can translate into some amount of uh, margin improvement and fourth over a period of time expenses also will contribute so while there are possibilities of positives and negatives on balance we think there is the there is the chance of a positive bias overall over the medium term with respect to margins got it so just on protection uh, given i understand some relatively smaller competitive entities or, or players are actually picking up in terms of lowering the uh, you know retail protection pricing and the market share gain have been happening at that side uh, how do you think about it now and how sustainable is it and uh, whether it is uh, impacting the man or the actual wage shift between uh, some share from the larger players to relatively smaller players so neeraj i would only point you to what we showed on the slide with respect to new business sum assured market share where we have actually gained market share from 13.2% to 15.7% i'm not really seeing any small player gaining in any fashion there are one or two mid sized players who are putting in more focus and that is bound to happen that is that's the way the business will operate but i'm not seeing that diluting our position in any way or creating a loss in market position for us got it uh, this is very helpful thank you so much uh, sir thank thanks neeraj thank you the next question is from the line of jayant karode from credit suisse please go ahead yes uh, thank you for the opportunity so two questions from my line between group term and credit life uh, which segment has grown faster in this quarter 
Uh, Jain, we have not given the breakup in business between the two. What I can, however, say that both have grown quite strongly. Okay. Uh, and sir, last quarter you had given a guidance that, uh, not a guidance, but what an indication that VMD growth will be in line with the industry uh, probably going ahead. Uh, where do you see that number settling at and, and is there any number in your mind? So, Jayan, we had said that in the context of life beyond FY23. Yeah. Uh, but that is something, again, we have not given any number guidance with respect to what it can be. Uh, we'll see at the end of the year whether we are wanting to do that. But as of now, we are not giving any number guidance beyond FY23. Sure, thank you. And just one last thing, sir. On the EG sensitivity to interest rates, have you seen that move up uh, steeply in the first half? Uh, just the calculated uh, economic variance seems to be slightly higher. So, the directionally, is that number moving up? Jan, we disclose sensitivities only at the end of the year. So, at the end of this year, you'll be able to see it. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pratik Bodar from Nippon India Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Hi, sir. Hi. So just one question and, and you know, looking beyond FI23, see in the last 18 months, we have had benefits of uh, good pricing on the group term side and we have had a wider product suite as well as a better distribution uh, access to uh, other banker partners, which uh, now going into FI24, if you can just, uh, or maybe medium term, if you can talk about what will drive growth for you on the AP side, not on the margin side, you've explained that very well. But maybe on the AP side, beyond FI23, what will be the real growth driver for you? Uh, Pratik, you want me to give a sense on where are the growth drivers? Okay. So yeah. if, I, if I really look at uh, from a channel perspective, um, you know, I, I already talked about uh, a little bit of opening up, uh, which is likely to happen from my RDA perspective, uh, in terms of uh, adding more bank partners and insurance partners by banks. Uh, here, you know, I do believe that uh, as a company, uh, over a period of time, uh, we have been able to get this uh, whole alliance proposition going, uh, growing quite strongly. Uh, that's the reason why we see the 30 bank partners, you know, primarily a banker promoted company. And this is uh, quite uh, unique, I would suggest. So that, given those uh, experiences and an ability to tie up, I think uh, the widening of uh, bank assurance itself could be one big platform where we would like to grow. Uh, you know, I am not saying that all the banks will jump into adding some nine insurance players. I'm not suggesting that. But I do believe that wherever uh, the growth momentum for the existing players are not happening, we can make a meaningful proposition to them to say that at least add us as the first player. I think that is going to be inherent part of our strategy going forward. Second, on agency, uh, that is an area where I do believe that uh, uh, we have done significant investments including manpower, addition of agents, et cetera, in the last uh, uh, year or so. Uh, and uh, as you know, this, uh, the business lacks the investments in agency because they have to come up to full productivity. So if you do that, um, you know, hopefully the agency would uh, grow from here on. Uh, it has been a bit of up and down depending on the base effect, but otherwise, uh, a secular basis, we do see agency contributing much more than what it is doing today. So that is the second channel. The third one is direct to consumer. This is an area where we do believe that we can make a huge difference. Uh, on one side, you have seen IRDA talk about Dimasuram. On the other side, we do have our own assisted, off, or assisted online channels and direct online channels, which are already contributing about 15% of our retail uh, AP. And given the kind of customer uh, base we have today, uh, we do believe that uh, <clears throat> this is a huge opportunity to go direct in terms of upsell and cross-sell. So, widening the bank assurance partner, uh, increasing the agency share further, and increasing the D2C, D2C share, I think this will be the medium-term growth uh, drivers uh, beyond 2023. This is how uh, we have uh, sized up our own uh, strategy. So, if I have to really look at long-term, I would uh, definitely expect agency to contribute at least one-third of our AP. That is broadly the direction in which we will grow. Uh, you know, with age, uh, with uh, Banka uh, continuing to stabilize and the other uh, uh, direct-to-consumer channel uh, contributing much more than what they are doing today. Directionally, this is where the company will be um, going in terms of uh, 
the growth sizes on the channel side. On the product side, now we have become completely a neutral to customer and the channel preference on the product side. We are no more queued to any particular product line, nor we have any preference to a particular product line. We just completely leave it to the emerging environment, market environment, or consumer preferences or channel preferences. They are happy to take the outcome. You know that is the way we have positioned on the product side. So this would be the approach uh, beyond 2023. And just wanted to check. You talked about, you know, uh, the the IDA, uh, in the, in the, the adding more bank partners. Uh, is there a margin of utility from a margin of utility perspective? If a bank already has three partners, uh, adding more does it make sense for them in your view? Yeah. So one extreme. Let me answer first. You know, to me, when we discuss internally, it doesn't make any sense for banks to go up to nine at all. So they let me throw out their adding nine because there will be a, a lot of uh, chaos will be there. On the shop mm-hmm. floors, and that is not uh, going to be something which is useful either to insurance companies or to the banks. But the on the other side, if you are looking at three becoming four or four becoming uh, three becoming five, that will really be a case to case basis. For example, if uh, some bank has got uh, already three partners, and let's say the momentum is not happening with one or two partners, that is where I meaningfully see a play. You know, in terms of going and presenting to them, showing them the numbers, and show what we have done with other uh, 39 bank partners. Mm-hmm. And I see the bank as well, uh, and then show it to them and make a pitch to say that maybe uh, they would benefit a lot by adding a fourth or fifth. Uh, I see a play only there. I mean, not really on a mass basis, uh, people adding and our uh, getting into every bank. That I'm not seeing that kind of a play. Uh, I'm just being practical about it. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Pradeep. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sham Srinivasan from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, and thank you for taking my question. Uh, sir, just one on some of the exposure graphs that have. Sham, can you speak up? Uh, Sham, I am not able to hear you. Well. Can you speak yes. up? Yeah, can. Can you hear me now? It's a bit. It's a little disturbed. A line is a little distorted, Sham. Volume is okay, but now we are getting cut. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just on the exposure graph, uh, one on expenses of management. One on payment of commission. What are your initial thoughts? I know these are still exposure drafts, but uh, is it going to benefit bigger players like you, visibly smaller? Could it lead to consolidation? Just your overall thoughts, industry, and you know what is your uh, micro story there on both those uh, both those exposure drafts? Yeah, overall thoughts. We believe that any such reform-oriented approach is very good. We welcome it uh, completely uh, because uh, uh, this also. Uh, helps us to uh, structure the payments the way we want to get the best outcome, uh, rather than talking about some, uh, you know, segmental basis or a micro management of, um, you know, what to pay here or what to pay there. Uh, that sort of gets uh, completely uh, overwritten by a overall limit. Uh, so that is a lot of operational flexibility from our perspective. Uh, second, uh, yes, of course, it is some uh, larger players like us will welcome it because it's uh, really beneficial to. Uh, companies uh, with uh, good expense ratio like us because if you look at our expense ratio will be probably top 2 uh, in the industry in terms of expense ratio so naturally it is beneficial to players like us so those are my initial thoughts of course uh, at what level uh, the expense stabilize or commission stabilize that we'll have to see uh, based on the competitive dynamics but uh, definitely the flexibility and uh, the efficiency the current stage we are in it is beneficial to us Uh, it's very helpful. Second question is on reinsurance supply. Uh, we have started seeing supply from a reinsurance perspective come back uh, now. Now that COVID has gone, and any chances that we will see very high price hikes? You think like last year uh, from them, or you think it's a little bit more nominalized now? So the way I would look at it, Sham, is to say that given our balance sheet capacity, current solvency. Uh, expected increase in subdebt limits and expected shift to risk based capital i would be perfectly happy even retaining more on my balance sheet if there is not adequate capacity from a reinsurance point of view so at least to participants in the market like us it doesn't matter too much beyond the point what is reinsurance capacity what is important is what is the price at which we are getting reinsurance in the context of the experience that we are seeing and over there 
at least our experience we are very comfortable that it experience in the context of our pricing is consistent so we are happy to retain more uh we'll see where it goes not really too concerned about capacity from where we are got it the last data point if i may try is on i think you called out a uh, guaranteed income contribution to ap in previous quarter uh, is it like still around the 20% number or it's gone higher than that sham i never called out guaranteed return products in the mix ever not last quarter not year end i i, I believe there's a, a 20% number sir that we had actually called out in 4q and i maybe my memory is wrong 20% of ap I don't know. So we haven't publicly disclosed it. Got it. Got it. Thank you, and all the best. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nishchand Jawate from Kotak Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Hi, Nishchand. Most of my questions have been answered. Just one, um, and this is uh, you know one of the news articles uh, uh, a couple of days back about uh, you know about GST uh, input tax credit where. I guess you know there was some investigation on the insurance industry. Uh, you know, just on behalf of the industry, can you kind of uh, make us, uh, you know, help us understand what really happened, and uh, does it mean that uh, you know you need to make any payouts right now, or probably make any provisions for payouts? So, Nishin, uh, you're right. This is an uh, inquiry that is being carried out with respect to the entire industry. The context of the inquiry is about certain expenses. and how gst input credit has been availed on that as far as i understand the entire industry and we are continuing to provide data and cooperation to the authorities as they are seeking they will have to go through their process and assess whether whatever evidence we have of the activities that are carried out are suitable or not we will wait for that process to conclude and if necessary afterwards it may move into litigation you know in order of magnitude or what it could be or even whether there will be any impact i think it is too premature to call because right now it is a data gathering exercise by the authorities but have you paid anything right now to the authorities or is it something that uh, or, or provided for anything in the pnl uh listen then we we haven't spoken about any payments but generally whenever there is tax related litigation or inquiry and this is true in litigation as well expectation is to deposit some proportion of the disputed amount up front and then continue with the litigation and eventually the decision of adjudication will decide whether it goes in our favor or not in which case if it goes in our favor we get a refund of whatever we deposited sure and and then uh, this this kind of probably has uh, i mean if you're making a advance payment this kind of has some implication on the pnl it doesn't advance payment has no implication only when there is a substantive action does any implication on pnl uh, even get considered okay so this this you would probably from a pnl point of view consider as an advance payment to the income tax. that is correct okay perfect i think that was my question thank you very much and all the best thank, thank you thank you the next question is from the line of manish gupta from solidarity advisors please go ahead uh, uh thank you for the opportunity so what i wanted to understand is that you know the way we measure our progress is doubling of vnb between fy19 and fy23 now typically in other uh, cat- categories in insurance what we see is that the experience of people in group term has been very very poor so for example if we see health insurance the combined ratio in uh, group policies is well over 100 meaning it's a loss making proposition now my question to you is that in life insurance the true profitability is only measured over long periods of time when you make the adjustment on the ev so is there a uh, can you give some data if you can share about what your experience in group term has been vis-a-vis what your assumptions are because as we measure progress through vnb we can end up reporting very good vnb when we book these policies only to reverse it at a later date so i just wanted to understand whether my interpretation of the accounting is correct and what your experience in group term has been this will be the vmd margins we've estimated in the past thank you bani sir perfectly valid question uh, one should not look only at vnb one should also look at movement in embedded value 
particularly within that the operating experience variance and assumption change impact over a period of time you will notice from slide 64 in our presentation deck that over the years right from fi 18 onwards and even before when we did the uh, ipo uh, disclosure from fi 16 onwards mortality morbidity variance has been consistently positive with the exception of the pandemic period and this has been only possible because both group as well as retail and within group credit life and group term have consistently delivered positive operating variance so from our point of view at the level of pricing that we are operating and offering the products on we are very comfortable with the loss ratios and the profitability emerging health particularly within health corporate health may be a completely different ball game from what you see in life clearly at least from outside in what i have seen of that and what i know of the life insurance industry i have no reason to believe that for the significant companies group term should be a loss making proposition i can confirm this for ourselves this has been consistently positive over the years okay thank you and uh, one more question is that you know because the accounting and life insurance is fairly complicated if one was to look at accounting very very simply you know how does one think about from a shareholder perspective what is the return on equity of an insurance company so this this is this is really the tricky part the problem is return on equity i will have to associate it with the uh, profit under an accounting standard and given the indian accounting standard today the return on equity becomes a very distorted measure so let me give you an example if i am selling 100 rupees worth of term life policy under indian gap i may well have a first year pnl which is a loss of 200 if i were to if i were to account on an ifrs 17 basis i may well have an answer where the first year profit is not a loss but a first year profit may be 25 rupees now between the two how do i determine what is return on equity that is yeah. the tricky part of it which is why as a proxy to return on equity what we use is return on embedded value essentially what we are saying is that the embedded value which is the pool of future profits is like the capital which is supporting business growth and the uh, operating ev profit is the equivalent of a profit metric in that context and that's how we are looking at the equivalent of return on equity so an roev of a 16 to 17% does seem like a reasonable level for somebody like us to be operating on and that is what at least in the current accounting context manish i would prefer looking at as a measure of return on equity of course tomorrow if we move to an ifrs 17 basis we may well decide that the ev approach can be junked and we can move with the financial statements itself and an roe the way it would emerge from that as a true measure of profitability but that to my mind is a little out into the future for now our view is the current framework of embedded value and return on embedded value is the closest substitute if you will to return on equity that we would uh, consider appropriate but have you ever calculated the roe on an ifrs basis yes we have that's what i was telling you that if with a with, a, with no new business train it's effectively no capital deployed No, I hear that. I hear you. But if you were to uh, calculate your ROE today on an IFRS basis, what would it be? IFRS is still India has not started reporting on an IFRS basis, Manish. It's still another two to three years later. I gave you a representative information, but I'm saying that I don't have a capital. I don't have a loss in the first year at all, so there is no capital to be provided. So technically, it is infinite ROE. Oh. Uh. Okay, maybe I'll just take this offline. Thank you. Sure, sure, sure. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Swarnab Mukherjee from BNK Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Thank you again for the opportunity. So, a uh, couple of question. Uh, one is on uh, the September New Business Monthly data that was released. What I had noticed was that for the group business, if I calculate the APE. 
generally for the uh, top players uh, uh, as well as i think for you uh, the group ap number was quite tepid uh, so if if you could uh, give some color on you know why would that be the case is there a base effect or something other in play given that dispersals particularly have been very uh, you know continue to be strong and i was kind of expecting that the credit life portfolio would uh, uh, you know continue to be robust at least so some color on that piece one of the group business has multiple parts you have group term you have group credit life which are protection oriented and then you have the group funds business by nature the group funds business is a very lumpy business i don't think you can ever arrive at any conclusion on trends and patterns based based on monthly numbers with respect to the group ap okay sir so uh, i mean the only trend that i picked up was that for all the larger players it was uh, bit uh, you know slow so that's why i thought that was anything to read at at the industry level trend or anything so i would i would actually suggest one of that i don't think there is any trend at all in that if you look over a period of time okay sir sure uh, another question a bit fundamental question sir so uh, if i look at the persistency numbers say the 60 month persistency at 5 uh, months fy23 Uh, that should be a function of uh, what your product mix or uh, channel mix and customer mix was at 5 month uh, at fy 2018 right and also maybe how they are behaving right now does it uh, have to do with anything else to read into you are absolutely right for nothing else nothing else right so whether you know what would be the uh, new business uh, environment right now has nothing to do with that right not at all Yeah. That's all from my side sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for Thank you. Thank you. As there are no further questions, I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. NS Kanan for closing comments. Thank you. We have uh, answered all the questions and uh, in case there are any residual questions please uh, talk to our team. So thank you so much for joining on a Saturday evening. Uh, sorry to have bothered you on a Saturday. We just finished the board meeting so we didn't have a choice. Thank you so much and have a great weekend. Bye. Thank you. On behalf of that we conclude this conference thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines